And once again, we are here on Living in the 21st Century. Joining me today is Laura Sampson. She is a Civil Rights Fellow, and she's from the Lawyers for Civil Rights. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Sure. Now, we have a lot to talk about <laughs> in 30 minutes, <laughs> but um, I think there are some very important questions. And, you know, often when we hear about civil rights, we look at the rights that humans have to live by in order to exist comfortably in society. And in the last past couple of years, we found that since this new government had came into power, there was a uproar in how we were trying to get along as human beings in a civil position. Tell me something, um, and I want to first look at the, 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 the immigrants and the, those who are trying to get into this country here at the borders, how kids are ripped from their parents' hand and they are put in cages, even though it is denied by some immigration officials that it's not so. We already see it on television and it is so. Um, what threat do that pose to immigrants coming here and what rights do they have as a people? At Lawyers for Civil Rights, mm -hmm. we have seen the Trump administration mm -hmm. try to override mm -hmm. a long existing system of mm -hmm. immigration law and mm -hmm. immigration protections. Yes. It is black letter law that individuals who come to the United States mm -hmm. have a right to seek asylum. Yes. And yet you hear the Trump administration decry the concept of asylum, claim that it's easy to get, claim mm -hmm. that you just are told by a lawyer to mm -hmm. utter a few words mm -hmm. and the interview is over as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. and that isn't true at all. Mm -hmm. Asylum can take years to yes. get. It requires a demonstration of credible fear. Mm -hmm. It requires a lot of documentation, mm -hmm. a lot of interviewing, mm -hmm. and it's incredibly difficult. It's a very high bar to meet. Mm -hmm. And the Trump administration has not acknowledged that. Instead, they've engaged in fear mongering. Yes. When one um, important aspect is mm -hmm. when children are separated from their parents, mm -hmm. the psychological harm they endure mm -hmm. lasts much longer than the separation itself. Mm -hmm. uh, a case that our organization worked on was to reunite a family that had been separated by yes. this administration mm -hmm. and then to actually seek damages from the federal government mm -hmm. in order to set up a mental health fund right. for those children who've been separated from their mm -hmm. families and so have endured incredible psychological mm -hmm. trauma. As as a result of that cruel and inhumane policy. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you're right with this thing, and we often heard, and this came out of Trump mouth from mm -hmm. day one when he was running for elections. He said that Mexico sent most of the, the criminals here, the rapists, the, the thieves, the, the, the drug dealers, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm quite sure that that's not really the case. Most illegal drugs that try to come through this country came in uh, legal entries of the ports and they were seized, right? Um, is it a case where Trump is actually fear mongering to the point that he can get a segment of people buy into his crazy concept that these immigrants coming here to steal our jobs, they are coming here to commit crimes, they are coming here. Now, the reality is we know for a fact that these people are refugees running from their different regions simply because of the violence and the criminal behavior, even places like Syria and um, in, in those countries where crime is to, it's gone beyond my imagination and people just running for their lives. What would you have to say, uh, I mean it's difficult to speak to these people because they're not here, but what would you like the public to know that rather than buying into the crazy rhetoric that Trump is speaking, that this is far from the truth. What would you want to say to those people? I would want them to see mm -hmm. these folks as their neighbors, yes. their teachers, mm -hmm. their colleagues, mm -hmm. their classmates, mm -hmm. those who are bagging groceries in the grocery store and mm -hmm. teaching classes at the elementary mm -hmm. school. Immigrants are part of the fabric mm -hmm. of places like Boston and Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. They're the reason that our population grows. They're mm -hmm. the reason that our state can be dynamic. They're, mm -hmm. in fact, part of the fabric of this country. Mm -hmm. And the idea that immigrants are being treated as some kind of scourge on the body politic
politic mm -hmm. is just contrary to all the evidence. Mm -hmm. We know that the rates of crime among immigrants are lower than in the native-born population. That's true. We know that immigrants mm -hmm. contribute to our social security net at mm -hmm. far greater rates than they take out. So mm -hmm. that immigrants prop up things like Medicare and social security mm -hmm. even as they can't actually mm -hmm. draw from those benefits. Mm -hmm. Without immigrants to pick our food or to work in our home health care situations, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be able to function. And so I'd encourage folks mm -hmm. to think about their neighbors when they're thinking about immigrants. Not, you know, a faceless whore that the president is portraying, mm -hmm. but people like you and me who mm -hmm. come here to work, to raise their children, mm -hmm. to attend school, to pay mm -hmm. their taxes, mm -hmm. and to live in this country. Well, you are 100 percent correct there again because if you ask me, the majority of the immigrants, they came here to work, they pay their taxes, they do their due diligence, and they are contributing significantly to the gross domestic product, the gross national product of this country, while the real Americans who were born here, a lot of them, despite of what the government may say that they are immigrants who come here on the system and going on Section 8 and going on and living on welfare and this kind of stuff, they are far more Americans who are on the system than immigrants. Because when you come through immigration, they're telling you straight up front, you can't go on the system. And if should you go on the system, there's a price to pay for that. So I don't think it's to the extreme that government is making it out to be. Absolutely, and, and to some degree, the government is describing a prob, uh, you know, a problem in search of a solution mm -hmm. when there, in fact, is no real problem. Exactly. I, I think a wonderful example of this is the Trump administration's mm -hmm. public charge regulation. Mm -hmm. So this happened in the fall. Um, the Trump administration announced that individuals who have used um, benefits in some capacity mm -hmm. it would be much harder for them to get green cards, mm -hmm. but. To some extent, the Trump administration is describing an issue that isn't really happening. Exactly. A, lot of, a lot of the benefits they're describing, immigrants are actually barred from receiving. Mm -hmm. Not to mention that a lot of those benefits are used on really temporary bases. You know, if an individual yes. is between jobs or mm -hmm. needs something for their minor children. Right. It ignores the fact that, with the exception of the elderly, immigrants also use benefits at mm -hmm. a far lower rate than the native-born population. And so what you're essentially doing is criminalizing poverty and criminalizing a particular kind of immigrant mm -hmm. who you imagine as the immigrant that's come through you know family migration as opposed to someone professional right. from Norway as the mm -hmm. president has said he would prefer. Mm -hmm. We saw a shift here recently where it uh, happened I think it was this week um, where the president um, made this declaration that um, Im immigrants or illegal immigrants can now run and go to these sanctuary cities mm -hmm. and I hope the public at large don't believe that this is some compassionate thing that he's looking to do. Because in one breath he said before that he's going to withhold funding for sanctuary cities. And now he wants to send immigrants to sanctuary cities. Is that to target the, uh, those sanctuary cities in a way that they can now find where these illeg illegal immigrants are? Or is it a, um, a campaign promotion or a way of finding his way to get back into power next year and then do what he's continuously doing? Absolutely. And part of a larger tactic of fear mongering mm -hmm. and spreading hate, particularly mm -hmm. targeted at immigrant communities. Mm -hmm. Lawyers for Civil Rights has actually brought a sanctuary city case mm -hmm. on behalf of the cities of Lawrence and Chelsea right. in order to ensure that the federal government couldn't just end funding to sanctuary right. cities because they have policies of not assisting mm -hmm. um, immigration law enforcement mm -hmm. when it comes to rounding up mm -hmm. um, hard-working mm -hmm. um, immigrants in those right. who in those communities. Mm -hmm. And the Trump administration has been told by mm -hmm. multiple federal courts that these policies of trying to target and attack mm -hmm. immigrants, but also mm -hmm. those who would help and protect immigrants, mm -hmm. is not only unlawful, but is cruel and unproductive. Mm -hmm. You create situations where immigrants are afraid to mm -hmm. go to law enforcement to speak up about domestic violence mm -hmm. because they fear they're going to be deported by ICE. And right. in that situation, none mm -hmm. of us are safe. We are mm -hmm. all of us made yes. more unsafe That's by right. fear and unwillingness to engage with our community law enforcement. Th that, that is true. That is true. What, what can people do to support civil rights and immigration rights? Advocates in their work, what, what can they do to be more effective? We at Lawyers for Civil Rights mm -hmm. rely on community support, and mm -hmm. that comes in a lot of different forums. Okay. So first and foremost, um, we want to spread the word, the mm -hmm. truth, sort of counter misinformation. Right. And that means you know, spreading information about 
public charge or about hate crimes or about sanctuary cities, real information about who immigrants are, what they do, and how they don't pose a threat to a particular way of life. Right. We also would love to have support for the cases we file. Mm -hmm. So, for example, on Tuesday in Boston at 3 p.m., mm -hmm. there's going to be a hearing on our motion to compel in our TPS case. Mm -hmm. So when um, the president announced that he was canceling TPS for mm -hmm. a series of countries, right. um, in particular Haiti, El Salvador, mm -hmm. um, and other Central American countries, mm -hmm. we filed a lawsuit mm -hmm. arguing that this cancellation was based on racial animus, mm -hmm. that the president was biased against these nations and yes. wasn't, wasn't making a decision based mm -hmm. on security or any other concerns mm -hmm. and the government has been utterly unwilling to cooperate with us in mm -hmm. providing information that mm -hmm. would show mm -hmm. how it made its decision mm -hmm. so what the public could do is come to that hearing at right. the federal courthouse mm -hmm. in Boston at 3 mm -hmm. and show their support for individuals living with TPS mm -hmm. thousands of whom reside in Boston and mm -hmm. live and work and send their children to school and like I said are an important part of the fabric of this Commonwealth yes. well I think too it is highly racial profiling. Um, here, he would refer to those countries as shithole countries. And it was a situation where he said he wanted to see more migrants from places like, uh, I think, is it Switzerland or and something? Norway. Oh, no Norway, right, mm -hmm. correct, uh, correct. Now, that's a big differentiation mm -hmm. in complexions and appearances. But these other minor countries are referred to as shithole countries. And he wants to stop the, da the, TP the tempor temporary protective status against these people who were brought here not because they tried to creep into the country. They were brought here because of natural disasters mm -hmm. and it was given the rights to stay here in this country. Now we're all human beings. And human beings can do what human beings are supposed to do. We're gonna, we're gonna procreate, we're gonna settle down and try to make a living for yourselves. What give him the right to come and upset that settlement or what these people would have tried to then join the period that they were there? One thing that we've identified mm -hmm. at LCR is that these proclamations from the Department of Homeland Security mm -hmm. actually contrast with the evidence put out by other parts of the federal government. Mm -hmm. So a good example of this mm -hmm. is last year, the Trump administration announced it was going to cancel Deferred Import Enforcement Departure, DED, mm -hmm. for Liberian citizens, which mm -hmm. is a, a program that's similar to TPS that provided right. protection for Liberian nationals. Mm -hmm. um, Liberia, of course, underwent one of the worst Ebola epidemics in history. Uh, there was a civil war. Uh, the country was experiencing great unrest and would have been unable to reassimilate the thousands of Liberians who live in the United States. Mm -hmm. And even as the State Department put out travel advisories warning Americans not to travel to Liberia right. because it was unsafe, the Trump administration declared that they believed there was no crisis in Liberia, mm -hmm. there was no need to maintain this status, mm -hmm. and that it could be canceled. Even as he made comments that were highly racist against mm -hmm. African nations like what you've described. Yes. And Lawyers for Civil Rights brought a case earlier this this year mm -hmm. challenging the cancellation of deferred enforcement departure mm -hmm. and I'm pleased to say that on the eve of our mm -hmm. argument against the government the government backed off and agreed to extend the status mm -hmm. for another year uh, while we litigate this case so while that is relief for our Liberian clients mm -hmm. for a short period of time mm -hmm. this doesn't change the fact that it's exactly. just an, another example of targeting countries on the mm -hmm. basis of race contrary to mm -hmm. evidence from the federal government itself that's right. Um, one of the things that I, I would love to touch on here is minorities, and especially black minorities and uh, those of lesser fortunate um, privileges than what the average American people will have, Hispanics, etc. There's no doubt that these people are targets. But what gets me? is when you see an unarmed person run from the cops, and I, I believe and I firmly believe that black people just don't run from the cops because they want to run from the cops. I think it is hereditated in our genes and the spiritual DNA that we were accustomed to being lynched. We were, we were, whenever you see the authorities, they weren't there for a good reason. They were there to either hang you or kill you, do, do something that will bring harm to your body. And it's still happening today. Mm -hmm. So you can sense this as a black person, this can't be coming, and you may very well be innocent. You can do one thing. 
But you know that this is no good intention. And some of the mayors from those cities allow this to go on for, for, for decades. My fighting back there in um, Washington, mm -hmm. that we had a mayor that was allowing um, these criminal activities to be going on. They were getting sued all the time. They were paying out a lot of, paying out a lot of lawsuits for um, diabolical actions against innocent black folks. Mm -hmm. Now, with that being said, do you think that is about time? And I don't want to hear government saying, well, look, you know what, every city got to run their own things. Do you think that is about time that there is a federal law that passed to protect the rights? And this is not to discriminate, discriminate in any form, but specifically to protect the rights of minorities who are subject to profiling. And we know that we have the Constitution there, and we all got equal rights and all this kind of thing. That's what the Constitution says. That's what is on paper. But in reality, it don't exist. It's just paper. And police departments all across this place lie and hide up for their cops when they're doing these ridiculous things to, to um, innocent people, and they get into walk free while people are burying their loved ones in the name of innocency and getting murdered. What would you want to say to government in this form in terms of protecting minorities? I know you just don't want to have a law for minorities and one, it wouldn't be right. It has to go for everybody as a federal law. But I think there should be something put in place to protect the innocent. Because the innocent black men and black women, and even Hispanics in these cases, and in some cases, even Muslims in these cases, aren't protected. It may seem one way they are, but they are not. They are racially profiled. And what would be your input on that? I am, of course, horrified by mm -hmm. the constant stream of stories mm -hmm. demonstrating mm -hmm. that across this country mm -hmm. that black and brown people are mm -hmm. targeted by law enforcement mm -hmm. in a greater degree than yes. their white counterparts. Mm -hmm. A really good recent example mm -hmm. is Springfield mm -hmm. where multiple police officers mm -hmm. were indicted mm -hmm. for following an individual mm -hmm. after a bar uh, conversation mm -hmm. and jumping on him and attacking him. Mm -hmm. The city of Springfield has been investigated by the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. The same Department of Justice that has investigated places like Ferguson mm -hmm. because of the racial profiling inherent mm -hmm. in how police officers have treated youths of color. Mm -hmm. An important development in Springfield was a case recently that allowed the city itself to be held liable mm -hmm. for the police department's mm -hmm. failure to properly address mm -hmm. complaints against individual mm -hmm. officers. What the the police department had been doing was saying, well, there's a complaint against the officer, the mm -hmm. officer has denied it, and because there's a conflict in the evidence, we're mm -hmm. not going to allow the complaint to go forward. Mm -hmm. But there's always going to be a conflict in the of evidence, course. right? The mm -hmm. officer is always going to deny, the mm -hmm. complainant is always going to mm -hmm. maintain that they were mistreated. And, this, and the federal court actually held mm -hmm. that that was improper and that because mm -hmm. there was this policy or practice mm -hmm. of sweeping under the rug these complaints, right. mm -hmm. the city could be held liable. Mm -hmm. And we think that that can be an important tool going forward mm -hmm. to hold this agency accountable mm -hmm. for its treatment of black and brown people. Mm -hmm. And so civil rights lawyers mm -hmm. like us can be fighters in mm -hmm. ensuring that when people are mistreated by the police, mm -hmm that they come to us mm -hmm. and we can bring their cases to light. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a case right now involving mm -hmm. a man um, named Terrence Coleman, mm -hmm. Coleman mm -hmm. um, a man who had a black man with uh, mental disabilities right. who was murdered by police. And we've been representing his family in their mm -hmm. lawsuit. And he is just one of many individuals uh, mm -hmm. who has been subject to mistreatment by the police mm -hmm. because of a failure to do everything from properly train officers mm -hmm. to uh, properly figure out how to engage with individuals mm -hmm. in a crisis situation. Um, so that is an important cornerstone of our work mm -hmm. and one that we recognize touches mm -hmm. in a particularly harsh way upon mm -hmm. black and brown community members. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that parents in this 21st century should be engaged in teaching their kids? Um, and we are, in a dem we are in a democratic society. Should parents be concerned Rather, they can be taking their the time and put it into more important things. 
be concerned in how we tell our kids how to walk, where you should walk, what time you should walk there. If you see a police, don't run. Um, what would you have to say to parents and their young black kids growing up in a society where they can easily be harmed by law enforcement for no reason at all, just because of the color of your skin? What kind of advice would you want to give those parents? We at Lawyers mm -hmm. for Civil Rights believe that education is power, mm -hmm. knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. We try to hold Know Your Rights trainings mm -hmm. ourselves and with our community right. partners, partners mm -hmm. to articulate to folks what rights they have when, for yes. example, they're confronted by police, mm -hmm. what they're obligated to do if mm -hmm. they're asked to be searched, if right. someone comes to their car, if someone mm -hmm. comes to their home. We do the same with immigrant families mm -hmm. when, you know, if, if ICE should come calling, to ensure that they have the tools they need right. to respond calmly, articulately, mm -hmm. and confidently to law enforcement, mm -hmm. that someone has trained them, that someone is looking out for them, mm -hmm. and that they are protected. We often say at LCR that we're community lawyers. Mm -hmm. And what that means is we think, you know, wealthy people tend to have attorneys on retainer. Mm -hmm. But we're on retainer for communities of color. Mm -hmm. We are the people they can call if something goes wrong. Right. And that is both before an incident in providing mm -hmm. those kinds of trainings and after an incident to ensure that we can speak up if we see someone racially profiled mm -hmm. and hold police departments or mm -hmm. cities accountable for mm -hmm. their mistreatment of black and brown citizens. Mm -hmm. um, is it a law that states that a police should have reasonable suspicion or reasonable doubt or something before they can pull you over and search you? Or unless you have a tail light that's broken or if you have a, a license that is expired or your insurance is not up to date, a, car, a cop just pulling you over at random and searching you, is that legal? No, it's, it's absolutely not legal for a police officer without any suspicion or any reason at all mm -hmm. to target or identify an mm -hmm. individual and, and harass them and bring them to the side mm -hmm. of the road and force them to be searched. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And what you're describing, that kind of profiling, mm -hmm. is something we see against our communities right. all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's where that education is important, mm -hmm. being clear with folks about what they should demand mm -hmm. of a police officer mm -hmm. if they are pulled over they are placed mm -hmm. into that situation mm -hmm. what their rights are when and when they uh, when and when not they should articulate mm -hmm. their right to be mm -hmm. silent and to really ensure that those communities can fight back mm -hmm. you know when you're targeted by the police it mm -hmm. can feel as if you're small you're one person against the force of mm -hmm. the commonwealth and our goal is to empower communities of color right. so they don't feel so alone in those right. moments where they're mm -hmm. being targeted okay and when they are targeted under these circumstances um, do they have, cause trying to get rid of the cop it, or making a complaint isn't going to make any difference. What is their next step? Should they sue the, the, the department for um, wrongfully profiling you um, before the cause? Or what should they do from there? What, what is their next step? We encourage anyone out there who mm -hmm. has had a run-in with police where they felt like they were treated unfairly mm -hmm. to contact us. Right. Come to groups like Lawyers for Civil Rights mm -hmm. so we can hear your story, mm -hmm. we can provide you with advice, mm -hmm. and we can take your case if we feel like there's mm -hmm. a viable option there to mm -hmm. make real impactful change. We are impact litigation attorneys, mm -hmm. so we bring large cases that can have right. large-scale change, that yes. can change the law for folks going forward. Mm -hmm. And so your decision to come speak with us, to mm -hmm. tell your story and allow us to say go public or bring a case on your behalf mm -hmm. can mean that other individuals won't be stopped and harassed and mistreated in that way. We mm -hmm. rely on people who are courageous to, enough to come forward and mm -hmm. share with us to make the way possible for others who come after them. Okay. So we, we're coming down to our last five minutes mm -hmm. of the show. So I want to touch a little bit about um, institutionalized racism. Um, we recognize now in this 21st century, since Donald Trump had came into power, that there are a lot of companies, even though he would have given this huge tax break, which put money back in their pockets, there are a lot of companies out there who are um, cutting salaries, cutting time so that they don't have to pay insurance, um, paying people per diem. They are more engaged in unethical behavior towards their employees, like probably here, 
recently it's stop and shop we had Joe Biden just spoke mm -hmm. against the manner in which they were treated and so forth um, do you see an escalation in institutionalized I don't want to use the word institutionalized racism but I would use it nevertheless um, that is one part and also an escalation where businesses all across America since Trump came into power trying to decrease privileges, whether it's insurance, whether it is uh, retirement plans, firing people and making sure they don't get paid for the time they would have committed to their company. Do you see any escalation of that um, happening most recently? At Lawyers for Civil Rights, we've seen two things. Mm -hmm. The first is, since the uh, ascent of Donald Trump, mm -hmm. absolutely an escalation in in hate crimes, in yes. hateful language, mm -hmm. in every place from you mm -hmm. know students at Boston Public School who report seeing racial graffiti in their bathrooms, mm -hmm. to more and more people calling our hotline to report instances of bias mm -hmm. against them. So absolutely there has been an uptick because mm -hmm. that kind of rhetoric impacts everyone and, and, and encourages and, and fosters a culture in which mm -hmm. that kind of cruelty is allowed to thrive. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, mm -hmm. I think it does a disservice mm -hmm. to just say that Donald Trump is the cause of mm -hmm. the institutionalized racism that has mm -hmm. existed, especially right, right, in Boston right. and Massachusetts mm -hmm. for so long. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's simply inarguable that right. in Massachusetts we are number one for things like education right. and mm -hmm. healthcare, but only 34 for educational mm -hmm. equality by race. Mm -hmm. In Massachusetts, even as the average wealth of a white family is mm -hmm. over $200,000, mm -hmm. the average wealth of a black family is $8. Mm -hmm. And that's not Donald Trump. That's right. years and years mm -hmm. of redlining, of a mm -hmm. refusal to treat African Americans with respect, to mm -hmm. promote them in mm -hmm. public employment, to give them mortgages, to engage with them fairly on student loans, mm -hmm. that this is deeper and more rooted than just Donald Trump, mm -hmm. who may be an expression mm -hmm. of this kind of hatred, mm -hmm. but is not the sole root right. cause of mm -hmm. this long history mm -hmm. of segregation and mm -hmm. institutionalized racism, mm -hmm. even in places that right. think of themselves as progressive, mm -hmm. like Boston does, mm -hmm. or like Massachusetts does. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I was just getting that if there were a more escalation in this kind of decorum, since he would have came in to power. Right. So um, we're down to the last two minutes. Um, what advice would you want to give anyone out there right now at this point who may encounter not only malpractice of uh, police behavior, um, problems that they may encounter in the workplace that may need critical attention, uh, what advice at this point would you want to say to those people? Uh, at Lawyers for Civil Rights, we encourage everyone mm -hmm. to report what you see mm -hmm. to groups like us. Mm -hmm. We can help if we know. Mm -hmm. So we have an, an email address, we have a phone number, mm -hmm. we have you know mm -hmm. our office. Please come to us if mm -hmm. you see is instances of discrimination mm -hmm. with police, in mm -hmm. employment, in voting, in housing, mm -hmm. in education, because we can help you if we mm -hmm. see the kind of patterns that suggest intervention is necessary. Okay. I also want to encourage folks mm -hmm. who I think might feel demoralized because yes. of the rhetoric we're hearing, mm -hmm. that even as we see an uptick in that rhetoric, mm -hmm. we are also seeing pushback. We're okay. seeing it in federal courts that have struck down mm -hmm. egregious demands from the White House. Mm -hmm. We're seeing it in people who gather in airports to mm -hmm. protest the Muslim ban. We mm -hmm. see it in folks who have been marching okay. on behalf of women's rights, that okay. there's an energy and enthusiasm to be Beautiful. celebrated as well. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. It's a pleasure having you, and I'm sure we'll be back again. We came to the end of our program. And to all those who have been tuning in, I want to say thank you once more, and have a nice day. Bye-bye.